Welcome, 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 saints of God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. All blessings flow. James 1.17 says that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. His word says that blessings overtake us. His word says that he turns the curse into a blessing. We are a grateful people, or should be a grateful people. We don't deserve anything he gives us. We deserve death, hell, and the grave. But in his mercy and through his grace, we have been given abundant blessings, abundant blessings. Praise God from whom every blessing flows. The hymn, showers of blessings, showers, not just a rainstorm, but showers and showers of blessings. Health, life, family, a job, food, water, air, breathing. It's all a blessing. It's all a good and perfect gift from the Father. Oh, saints, we need to be a grateful, grateful people. Amen? Amen. Well, we are in uh, the second week of a study called The Forerunner. Now, if you missed last week's show, just go to our website, brushstrokeministries.com, and click on the video archive, and you'll see the TV show. Or click on podcasts, and you can download it and listen to the show so that you don't miss it. If you missed it, it's okay because they are related but not interdependent on one another. We're talking about John the Baptist being the forerunner for Christ, his first coming. And if he's coming again, which we know that Jesus is coming again, who are the forerunners for his second coming? Well, we are. And if we are the forerunners for his second coming, then we should model our life after the first forerunner, John the Baptist. And so we're in a small study, a series called The Forerunner. And today I have a lesson called, Oh, What a Life. Oh, What a Life. And we're going to be taking a look at John's life over the next couple of weeks. And I am excited about what I am learning about John the Baptist. I've really never studied him as a character study in the scriptures. I've read, you know, the New Testament many, 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 many times. We read it, of course, Luke chapter 3, 2 and 3 in at Christmas time. Um, we read it uh, with the excitement of Christmas and the excitement of John being born. But we don't really read it for John. We read it for Jesus. But let me remind you the excitement that was uh, wrapped around John. The Old Testament, the book of Malachi, concludes with the proclamation and the prophecy that one will come in the spirit and power of Elijah. The Old Testament closes not with the hope of redemption only, but with the excitement that there is a forerunner coming to pronounce the one, Jesus. And so we're going to take a look at John's life. Oh, what a life. Now, John the Baptist's life lessons are so relevant for Christians today. So why should we take notice of who John was and what he did? Well, because John, uh, Matthew 11, 11 says that Jesus proclaiming John was the greatest man who ever lived. Now, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to that. But he was the greatest man born of women who ever lived. That's Jesus himself said that. So from Luke's gospel, it's clear that John's life is important because Dr. Luke took very good pains in establishing his story. 
So I want to take a look at this story today. Um, John's life was meant to be different. He was set aside for a divine purpose. He was meant to be not like everyone else. You know, remember the song from, I think it was Sesame Street, one of these things is not like the other. Well, John was like no other, right? From the extraordinary events surrounding his birth, remember his dad, Zechariah, was in the temple ministering and the angel Gabriel came to him and said, you're going to have a son, his name will be John, and he will be a prophet of the Most High God, bringing people to repentance. And when he was born, his father prophesied over him and said, son, you will be the prophet of the Most High God. Uh, remember when Elizabeth was pregnant with John, and when Mary came and tell her that she was pregnant with the Savior Jesus, that John leapt in his mother's womb, filled with the Spirit even from before birth. I won't even get into how important that is in this abortion fight. Abortion is wrong. Abortion is wrong. Abortion is murder. Because John leapt in Elizabeth's womb. That's how alive he was as a baby. I won't even go there any further. Just let it go. So the extraordinary circumstances surrounding John's birth to his ministry was crazy amazing. Now, John preached in the rugged desert and wilderness between Jerusalem and the Jordan River, known as the wilderness of Judea. Um, and a measure of revival began under his preaching. People from all over were affected by what he was speaking and preaching. Um, but let me ask you, we know, couple, everybody knows a couple basic things about John. One, he dressed in camel hair and a belt, and he ate locusts. Now, he didn't just arbitrarily go through his claws and go, hmm, beaver, uh, ram, uh, camel, I'll choose camel today. That's not what he did. He was very purposeful what he wore. It wasn't just that he was trying to be different, though he was different and his life was set apart to be different. But he had a very specific reason why he wore camel. I love God's word because it tells us what we need to know and what we need to understand. And it is full of revelation and truth. Now, we know that John was coming in the spirit and power of Elijah the Tishbite. Elijah the Tishbite. That's who he was coming in the spirit and power of. That's what it says in Isaiah. That's what it says in Malachi. It's what Jesus declared that he is Elijah, not resurrected, but came in the spirit and power of Elijah, that he was the forerunner, okay? So if you were going to have a call like that, how would you dress? What, what would be your mode of dress? I've got an answer. Um, 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 8. You're going to love this. 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 8. So they answered him, and they said, It was a hairy man wearing a leather belt around his waist. And he said, It's Elijah the Tishbite. There you have it. John was dressing for his call. He dressed for his call. Elijah, a hairy man with a belt around his waist. John, a hairy man with a camel with a belt around his waist. It wasn't just some willy-nilly decision to dress the part, to dress in a certain way. He was very purposeful and specific in why he dressed like he did. He was dressed for his call. Now, how does that connect with us? Well, let me ask you, are you dressing for your call? Oh, I don't have a call. Yes, we have a call. It's Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Go, make disciples of all men, 
right? We have a commission. We have a call. But more than that call, we have a call to dress a certain way. I'm not talking about revealing clothes or modest clothes, though I think it behooves a Christian to wear modest clothes and not to wear things that might be inappropriate. But it doesn't keep you from salvation, right? What I'm talking about is are we dressed for our call to be in this world, to minister in this world? Let me ask you, are you wearing God's white robe of righteousness? Are you dressed in righteousness or unrighteousness and sin? You see, if, if we're dressed in righteousness, then our behavior is righteous. Our speech is righteous. Our actions are righteous. We need to be wrapped in God's righteousness. Our righteousness, Isaiah tells us, is filthy rags. But God's righteousness is what we should be wearing for our call. We need to stand apart from the rest of the world and be righteous. But let me ask you another. Are you wrapped in zeal? God says that he wraps himself in zeal. Are we wrapped in the passion and the zeal for God? Are we wrapped in that ardent desire to serve him and to be a witness for him? Uh, we need to be dressed for our call. And what about the wardrobe of warfare? You know, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, helmet of salvation, the belt of truth, the shoes with preparation of the gospel of peace, and the sword of the spirit in our hand. Are we dressed for our call? That's what John demonstrates to me. He dressed specifically for his call. He said, if I'm going to be Elijah, if I'm going to come in the spirit and power of Elijah, that was what was prophesied over me. I'm going to come in the spirit and power of Elijah and I'm going to look like him. And it was a reminder to the Jews, the leadership of the Jews, who he came to be like. Remember, it was prophesied in the Old Testament, which is what the Jews hung on to. Malachi said there's one coming in the spirit and power of Elijah. And here's John the Baptist dressed like Elijah the Tishbite, a hairy man with a belt. We need to dress for our call. Now, the second thing we know about John is that he ate locusts and honey. Let me show you a scripture in Leviticus chapter 11, verse 22. These you may eat the locust after its kind, the destroying locust after its kind, the cricket after its kind, and the grasshopper after its kind. John ate what God declared was good to eat. John ate only that which was good for him to devour. It was told by the Lord himself when he said, Israel apart. He said, you can eat certain insects, but these are the insects you can eat. You can eat locusts. Well, praise God that John ate only what God said he should eat. Now, dried locusts dipped in honey doesn't sound very good to me, but it sounded good to John. Now, again, how does that relate to me? Well, what am I devouring? What am I putting in me? Is it good, been declared good by the Lord? How about R-rated movies with curse words and the Lord's name in vain? That shouldn't be going in me. Raunchy TV shows, that shouldn't be going in me. I shouldn't be eating any of it. I should only be eating that which God has declared is good. Well, what could that be? Well, it's things that don't offend him. Things that, that are G-rated or animated. Things that are pure and good and lovely. 
Think on those things. Participate in those things. We should not be eating anything that is not declared good by the Lord. And I'm telling you, there are too many Christians who are watching the wrong things, listening to the wrong music, listening to the wrong TV shows, and they're putting junk in them that God would not want in us. Period. What's one of the things we can eat? Jeremiah said, I found his word and I ate it and it was joy to me. The first happy meal. <laughs> the first happy meal was Jeremiah. I found your word and I ate it and it became joy to me. That really was the very first happy meal. McDonald's says nothing on Jeremiah. We need to be devouring God's word. Taking in the holy bread of life, the very manna of God is his word. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. He's the word of God. And we should be eating and devouring his word and good things, church, Bible studies, worship and prayer and praise, fellowshipping with fellow believers. That's what we should be partaking and eating and putting in our bodies, not this junk of the world. John ate what God said was okay to eat. He did not break the commandment. That's important. That's so important. The picture we get of John the Baptist is a man who lived simply and set apart. So should we. So should we. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. Ephesians 4, 17. Paul says to the Ephesian church, So I tell you this, and I actually insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. We should not be living like the rest of the world. When Paul says, I tell you this, and I insist on this in the Lord, what he's saying is the following instruction is God's command coming through me and not on my own. It's coming through me for you. God called believers to be different from the world throughout biblical history. When he called Israel, when he called Israel to be his people out of all the nations, he said this to them through Moses. Leviticus 18, verses 2 through 4. Speak to the Israelites and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You must not do as they did in Egypt where you used to live. And you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan where I am bringing you. Do not follow their practices. You must obey my laws and be careful to follow my decrees. I am the Lord your God. He wants us to be different. Israel was called to be different. He gave the Israelites over 600 laws to distinguish them from the other pagan nations and to teach them how to honor him, how to be holy, and how to worship him. We live in a society that is perverse and ungodly and full of sin, and we have to be different than all of it. Similarly, we read Paul, we read Moses. Let me show you Peter. This is 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. 1 Peter 4, 3 and 4. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They think it very strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation and they heap abuse on you. I love that verse. They think it very odd that you don't plunge into their perverse world. We don't act like the world. We don't talk like the world. Oh, that's the, one of the worst things that Christians do is they talk like the world. 
we should be speaking the word of life and the gospel and good things. They think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood. 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 A flood overtakes. And we're not to be overtaken by their flood. They think it's very odd. My family, my two sisters especially, think it very odd that I chose this life. They no longer speak to me because of this life that I have chosen. I believe it's because they're convicted when they're around me. I, I, and they don't want that. They don't want that conviction. Now, they don't speak to me, but if they would call me in a, in a moment, I'd be right there. I have nothing against them but love for them. They've chosen to cut me out. I will never cut them out of my life. But that's their decision. And I think it's because they believe it's so strange to live like I live. I'm not patting myself on the back. <clears throat> we should all be living a holy life. And if they're not living a holy life, there's going to be some ruffling of some feathers in that. Oil and water, don't mix, right? So we cannot plunge into the same dissipation, flood of dissipation. We need to be different like John. And let me give you one more. Paul said to the Corinthians, this will get you. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Do you not know? Hmm. that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. Were. But, love the word, but, you were washed, you were sanctified, set apart, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Hallelujah. And some of you were, but you were washed by the very blood of Jesus. You were sanctified, set apart, made holy and acceptable for his use. You were justified. You were accused and found not guilty. Even were, even better, innocent. You were found completely innocent of all charges of sin against you. Just as if you had never sin. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of our God. Some of us were those things, but we are no longer. We were meant to be different by what we, the way that we are dressing ourselves. And again, I don't mean the style of clothes. I mean righteous behavior, righteous speech, righteous thinking, wrapped in God's robe of righteousness, and eating that which God deemed good to eat. Not the junk. We should not be filling our hearts and our minds with the junk of this world, the crud of it, the sickness and perverseness of it. It's not for us. We were meant to be different from the world. That's the first lesson of John. He was meant to be different. The Ephesians, the Romans, the Corinthians were saved out of their sinful lifestyles to worship the true and living God 
And God called them to never go back. Today, the world is desperate. It is in a desperate need for people who are different, right? We need people who will carry their faith into the office, into Congress, into the courthouses, into the homes, into schools, into society, into stores, into malls, into this world. The world is desperate for people who are different, who will carry their faith into these places. We need people who are willing to be different, even if it costs us anything. We should be willing to be the forerunner for Christ, telling people, Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. He is coming again in judgment. We should be shouting that from the mountaintops, shouting it from the valleys, that he is coming again in judgment. And we don't want anyone to perish. We need to be different and shout that in this world. If we are the forerunners for Christ, which we are, we are the last generation who will be part of the church on this earth before he comes. This is our job. The lesson for us as followers is to be distinctive and set apart with those values that can only be God's values. That's our job as a forerunner. If we're going to look at John's life and his call to be different, to dress differently, to eat differently, then we have to do the same. Saints, that's our job. If you do not know this Jesus that we serve, will you let us introduce you to him? He's calling you to his life with you, one beautiful brushstroke at a time. God bless you. Thank you for watching today's program, One Brushstroke at a Time. If you have been blessed by this study, would you share your story with us? We want to hear how God is moving in hearts all around the globe. If you have a question, would like more information, or would like to request prayer, please visit our website at brushstrokeministries.com or connect with us on Facebook at Brushstroke Ministries. You may also contact us at Brushstroke Ministries, P.O. Box 2353, Buchanan, West Virginia, 26201. Join Jenny Fister every week at this time to hear a fresh revelation as she paints a beautiful picture of his word, one brushstroke at a time.